Good morning. Um, today I'm going to uh, uh, show you a little bit about what we do here at the NTSB with regard to recorders. Uh, as, um, as Kelly was saying, I'm the Director of Research and Engineering and so I run the laboratories here at the Safety Board. And um, what I'd like to do, break up this briefing into two separate parts. One here in this room, talk a little bit about um, some background on recorders if you have any questions about that and also some background and information about our laboratory and our staff and our workload and that sort of thing. And then the second part of the uh, uh, discussion, we'll go over to the laboratory and uh, we're going to walk you through the entire process of how we, um, once we receive recorders in the laboratory, how we process them and get to the end state to where data is then provided to the investigators. So we'll go through that whole process. You'll be able to see all the equipment and we'll explain the different um, techniques that, that we use. Um, just a couple of things I wanted to mention. Obviously, you know, recorders are the top priority. Getting the recorders and getting the data out are the top priority of, of, of any of our investigations. Um, they, they guide the field work immediately when, uh, and that's why we try to do this, uh, these downloads and get these data out to the field as quickly as possible because they can give some very uh, important information about perishable uh, uh, types of evidence that need to be retrieved. Um, but the work uh, uh, continues with the recorder information all the way through to the end of the investigation when we're doing work like simulation work, human factors work, uh, additional uh, interviews, and that sort of thing. So they're, they're constantly, the information from these is so vital, they're used throughout the entire investigation. Um, to give you an idea of the process, uh, let's, uh, most of my discussions here are going to focus on, say, large transport category aircraft uh, accidents. So we'll launch a GO team, and one of the priorities of the GO team is to get a hold of the, the recorders as soon as possible. Um, if they are able to be retrieved, let's say it's, it's, it's an accident where we can get to them rather quickly, it's not an underwater uh, recovery or something like that. Um, we will actually put them on our, uh, we would have flown out there on the FAA uh, aircraft. We will put them back on the aircraft, get them back to the laboratory within a matter of hours. Um, if not, if we're doing an underwater recovery, um, we'll go through, you know, the various processes of, of, of the uh, uh, search uh, teams that are out there. And, but, but ultimately, once the recorder, we get the recorder to the lab, our goal is to read out the uh, data from each of the recorders and get information back into the investigators hands within 24 hours. So we'll work on that basically nonstop until the data, the initial uh, data gets put out. And then we'll continue to work on those for a matter of, of weeks uh, uh, following uh, the initial work. Um, in front of me is, is just an example of a modern recorder. Just um, I'm sure most of you uh, know what uh, what these recorders are. This happens to be a combi a unit. A combi means it's a flight data recorder and a cockpit voice recorder in one. Uh, that's one of the more modern ones. Um, what you see here, uh, there's basically four four parts to a recorder. There's the chassis below, um, and that's just uh, uh, what it, what is used to mount into the aircraft. Uh, there's this portion of the recorder which is used to um, uh, house the electronics, to sample the data, to get it into uh, the, the memory. There's the crash-hardened memory module, and then there's the underwater locator beacon, commonly known as a pinger. And so all of these four uh, units work in concert um, on the aircraft, and that's what we define as a, as a recorder. When we go into the laboratory, we'll talk about um, how we access the data and uh, out of the um, uh, memory module, and um, and if you have any other questions, um, that would be appropriate time to ask those questions in the laboratory. Uh, just briefly uh, about our lab, I have 12 people in our laboratory. We work about 150 FDR and CVR total, so about 75 each uh, a year, and about one third of those are done. Uh, uh, for foreign governments to assist them in their investigations. Uh, our laboratory also does about 500 other types of downloads and readouts from a variety of things. 
Uh, anything that has non-volatile memory is valuable to our investigations. So we're talking about cell phones, we're talking about iPads, we're talking about GPS units and those sorts of things. Those uh, are treated in a, in a somewhat similar manner and if you have questions about that we can excuse me, answer that in the, in the laboratory. Um, recently we've invested about two million dollars in our laboratory to, uh, to be able to do the, the finest detail uh, work uh, uh, downloading recorders so we've gone far beyond the ability to just simply download an intact recorder. Uh, we can and, and often do get right down to the damaged memory chips themselves, repairing those chips uh, and getting data out uh, 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 through a variety of um, specialized equipment that we have in the lab and you'll be able to see that in there. Uh, I think that's a kind of a, a general overview uh, of, of our laboratory and our, and our capabilities. As I said, uh, so we would have already received the recorders uh, off of the FAA aircraft or whatever and have, and have basically cleaned them off and, and started to disassemble. And um, Aaron's going to show you a little bit more about what, what we would do, and in particular in a water um, submersion case, we would be using the ovens and, and, then, and then once dried, we'd start to probe the electronics and the memory to see if we, in fact, need to make any repairs so then we can go through the download process. So Aaron? So this is some examples of a flight data recorder and a cockpit voice recorder. Every accident's a little bit different, so they come in in varying stages. Um, this is obviously an intact one. Um, when there has been damage uh, or it's been any sort of exposure to heat or water, we go ahead and we want to check the integrity of the memory that's inside the unit. There is a um, chassis, so the chassis is the electronics that convert all of the information from the aircraft. It'll come through here, there's a series of boards in here, electronic equipment, and it'll go ahead and put it in the crash protected memory. This is the only part of the box that's actually crash protected, and this is the only part that we really worry about. We don't care if, if this part gets damaged, what we're concerned about is this part. So we have survivability requirements um, that all of the recorders are um, required to, uh, to go by um, to make sure that this part is not damaged inside of here. So sometimes we do get just the crash survivable memory part of it in. So what we'll do is we'll assess the recorder to see how it looks. We'll document it, take photographs, etc. cetera. Uh, in this case here, what we would do is we'd go ahead and take apart and take off the crash survivable memory we did here. So this part actually separates like this. You can see a connector here. This is the connector that feeds from the electronics into the crash survivable memory unit. I'll put this over here. So I have one taken apart here already. So once we deal with electronics, we go ahead and uh, take some precautions. This is an example of a crash survivable memory unit. Um, you can see the beacon here, and I'll show you the beacon in the next room and how we test those uh, just to, based on the expiration date, and we can hear the pinging to make sure that's still working. So in this case, just like the part I took off there, and I've already taken some of the hardware out of it, but basically we'll go ahead and disassemble. Um, all of the recorders, you know, have certain standards that they go by, but they're virtually, we have individual manufacturer instructions for all of them. Uh, no, there's generally three of big manufacturers nowadays, um, and there are some that are entering the market um, to get into GA, et cetera. So basically, these are different layers of the crash protection for the impact, the heat. So I've already disassembled this one since this was involved in an incident. Um, there was a, a type of material around here that we have to dig out to get to the actual unit that has the board in it. Something like this. We go ahead and take that off. 
There's a coating that's normally on top of the board. So in this case here, we've already removed the coating, and then we get to the actual memory board. The memory board has chips on it that have the data. There's requirements that allow the, the information to jump around as it's recorded. So if you lose one chip, you don't lose all of the airspeed data or all of the last one hour of the flight. So the information has to jump around. Some of these are just control chips and some of them are memory chips. What we do is we go ahead and check the integrity of the board to make sure that all of the information you know, is, is intact on there. If there's been heat exposure, there's temperature dots on some of the boards that will tell us how hot it got. And we want to make sure that the solder hasn't reflowed or there's been any, any damage to this um, memory unit. The other thing we'll do is replace the leads or put you know, new pins on to be able to put this into a surrogate unit or we'll actually move the chips off into a different memory unit. So, what percentage of the time is that board damaged for people who are local pilots? Is it a rare occurrence? It is, yeah. If for, you for open it up, that chip board is usually in good shape? Yeah. Yeah, many times it is. I mean, obviously, if it's, if it's gotten that level of heat exposure, we will put it through the x-ray. We'll make sure there's no cracked chips. Um, but generally, because of the protection that's in there, um, generally, it's in good shape. So we go ahead and um, Ben has an example of a board over there of, of what we're looking for. Great, so um, what I'm doing here is we do a visual inspection with this over so you can see what I'm looking at. So we'll do a visual inspection first with the microscope and check for any sorts of um, obvious physical damage, any kind of fracturing of the chips any of the uh, wire bonds that you see that may have come off during the impact. Um, this is a very, uh, this is sort of the first phase of our inspection. If we need to, if we see anything that looks interesting here or you know, raises any red flags for us, we'll go to the next step, which is uh, using our X-ray nanoscope um, to look at any sort of internal damage that may be happening in this, uh, in the memory chips. Um, from there, we have a, uh, a, a vast array of chip recovery tools, uh, many of the pieces of, equip of equipment that you see around um, this lab, uh, wire bonding stations, probing stations, desoldering stations, soldering stations, um, that is all the equipment that we use to recover when it is damaged uh, to, to that point. How many people do you have here that do this kind of analysis? Like how large is the team and you know, are, are, you, are you very Narrowly, um, it's, it's, a 12, it's a 12 person uh, uh, group in the laboratory and uh, everyone has a certain amount of uh, similar skills and then we have some specialists uh, that work in particular areas. Yeah. Right, so we, we participated in that work at the BEA. We had we had folks here travel there. Folks from this 12 yes. Team yes. And can you just sort of having had the experience of looking at a data recorder that was submerged for a long period of time, can you talk about you know what what did it look like? You know, you know were you know how was the condition of it, and what things could be right. done to maybe improve it? Well. It, it, a lot of that is documented uh, uh, by the BEA, but I'll just give you some generalities. Um, you know, it, it was exposed, to, the memory was exposed to water, so you had to go through a drying process to do that. And there was a certain amount of, uh, of corrosion uh, that was present, and so you had to be very careful about how you were going to then uh, try to get the data off of the chips. But beyond that, the specifics you can get from, from the BEA's documentation. Well, that's the, that's the neat thing. Um, uh, all of us uh, in the in the aviation uh, investigation community share our techniques and our knowledge, uh, and we actually have an annual meeting with all of the folks together to to talk about lessons learned, and uh, and so we do share whatever was learned there for you know to help us in the future. Uh, specific ones regarding how you investigate it after you retrieve, if, if you're able to retrieve, if it's able to be retrieved. Uh, 
we we have done right right so we've done we've done quite a few water recoveries salt water recoveries um, that that have been led by NTSB over the years um, and uh, and like I said we have yeah so we have a list and I can go through that with you a little later but um, one of the th the first steps and and what we didn't uh, talk about yet was the uh, vacuum dryer over there and uh, it, it's actually um, Peter you can just kind of point to it there and the desiccator um, and we go through a process of first conditioning the the boards to make sure that they're able to be dried out appropriately if you if you if you use inappropriate techniques you can essentially wind up cracking or uh, the, the computer chips uh, as they're going through the drying process so it, there's very careful process that these things need to go through and that's where we're talking about sharing lessons learned of what techniques were successful and what aren't this particular Device, how would you characterize the shape after crash or the condition after crash? As if you're opening that up, how would you describe uh, how it uh, survived the crash? It, it all depends. A lot of times, you know, this is the heaviest part since it has the, the uh, enclosure on it, so a lot of times it will separate from it. There may be some deformation. But, I mean, the, the survivability requirements are, you know, quite stringent. So um, a lot of times, you know, it, it will go ahead and uh, come out pretty intact. Um, the boxes are rated to 20,000 feet of hydrostatic pressure. So the water will get inside, as, as Joe mentioned. Our biggest thing is as soon as it comes out of the water, we immerse it in a fresh water. Uh, especially with salt because of the corrosive properties, the, the quicker that we can get it into water and during the entire travel process, it will travel here in water so that it is diffusing all of that salt and we'll change it out a couple of times sometimes. Um, we will disassemble it and wash it off as, as much as possible and as we, we take it out. Um, but once we get, a lot of times this cavity isn't breached in here. So it looks pretty much like this, but the water may have gotten in there. Um, we're very, very careful about making sure all of the salt is taken off. This RTV helps a lot because the RTV covers the entire board, um, this rubber material. Um, but we make sure that none of the salt has gotten in there and uh, diffuse it out and go ahead and put it in the drying oven. The, 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 the uh, recorders that have the most d uh, damage um, is mostly due to fire, uh, long duration exposure to fire. That's, that's the most common failure mode that we see. So, so water doesn't worry you as much as a fire does. Right. And I'm sorry if this is redundant, but if you do have a, a, a board like that that's, that's been sitting in salt water for a significant period of time, what's your experience in terms of how much usable data you can recover over how much period of time? In other words, if it's sitting there for weeks, months, years, We've had a good success rate with recovery. Um, all of the recorders, you know, go through different stresses, and, and uh, but overall, we've had a very good success rate with water recoveries. On um, it is because of the way that uh, the requirements are. You are, you know, there's some controllers and there's some memory chips. The data does jump from chip to chip. So even if you have one corrupt chip because it has cracked or it has gotten some sort of corrosion on it, we still should be able to build the information back so you won't lose the entire one last hour of the flight or all of the airspeed data like one parameter the data will jump as it's recording there have been boxes where you have not been able to get data out have you ever not been able to get something from data recording? fire when when the exposed rate there are survivability requirements for fire so there's a low uh, temperature fire and a high duration fire um, we have had cases where it's crashed in remote areas and the fire has been for an extended period of time to the point where it's past what the survivability standards are. Water recovery, have you ever not gotten data from a water recovery? I can't think of one. Which is good news if this was not Yeah, I mean, in, in, yeah, in years past, I can't think of one offhand where we haven't been able to get data off of it. Okay, so this is the Flight Data Recorder Laboratory. Uh, once we've uh, ensured the electrical and, uh, and physical integrity of the, um, of the recorders, we'll bring them in here. If we had to make repairs, we would have done that. We'll bring them in here and we'll begin to download the data 
uh, from the recorder into our computer systems. And we do that with the a variety of equipment here. Um, I'll just speak uh, briefly to, to what you see over here. These are chassis uh, recorders that are commonly used in all the aircraft that are flying today. And these are pristine new models. And so as uh, Aaron was saying, we'll take the memory, if it's heavily damaged unit, and we'll repopulate into a new, newer model uh, and then use the newer model as the playback vessel for our system. So I'll let Aaron uh, take it from there, essentially, uh, from taking the unit into our system and how she downloads the data. I'll grab one of these. So if it's a unit that hasn't been exposed to a lot of damage, we can generally play it back. We visually inspect it to make sure, but if it's, it hasn't been uh, pulled out of the airplane, this way. we go ahead and put it in a rack and it simulates power to the recorder in the back of the rack there. Each of the individual manufacturers has different um, ways that they play it out. So we have the power, but we use different cables and different varieties of ways to go ahead and uh, so get it out there. Oh, there we go. So once we go ahead and put power on to the unit, the unit will talk to a computer, again, that has manufacturer software on it. And what we're doing is we're downloading the data that is in the recorder into the computer system. And it'll give us either a good read, a file that should be at least 25 hours. Depending on which type of recorder it is, some of, the, some of them use compressed data and there may be a longer period of time, but the minimum requirement is 25 hours worth of data. So we might interrogate the unit just to see some of the information, the maintenance information, et cetera. But what it's gonna give us is a proprietary file and we just download it onto our system. From here on out, we'll generally work with this file instead of having to work with the recorder again unless we encounter some sort of an issue. In the case where it has been damaged, as Joe mentioned, what we'll do is we'll take the chassis of one of these surrogate units we have here and so this will go ahead and download and give us a file if it's a good read. If we have any problems or if there has been damage, what we'll do is take an NTSB chassis, we'll take memory, we'll plug the memory into one of our units, we'll plug this in and we'll download. So if the memory board is okay, we can go ahead and download it with one of our own units. Well, you showed us the pins on the end of the board. Correct. Why do you need to go back onto the chassis to download? Why can't you just come onto the pins and download? Uh, so on the memory chip, right. you've got the yep. pins on. So, so those, those pins go in here. You can't just go straight into your No. Memory. You've got to go back up. Yeah, the and there's, there's information in here such as markers. So it's a 25-hour continuous loop recording. Continuous loop is from the old tape days. But it's any time there's power on the aircraft, it will continue to record. Well, it writes over the oldest data. So it has an internal marker in here that tells it when the last time it powered down was. That's why sometimes if you actually lose the original unit and you're only working off the memory boards, all the data is there, but sometimes it's not in the order that you would normally see it where the last flight was the last hour on there. So there are you know, some information on here. This also tells the memory chips where it came from. There's different software and hardware in the aircraft. There's different software that will tell you, um, and I'll show you in the next room, but basically the data can record at 64 words per second, 128, all the data map information, that is you know, held in here, so it's just internal memory. So, but there's no way to interrogate the pins generally. If we actually get down to chip level, we would take the data out from the chip and have to rebuild it from there, which would be much more complicated. So this, it thinks it's back in some environment it's familiar with, and it downloads it almost as a normal file. Um, but we do have to be careful because, like I said, some of those markers may be lost, so we're just very, very, you know, careful about looking at the data to make sure that it looks the way it's supposed to. Um, but generally, like I said, if, even if we have to put some new leads on it, um, you know, replace this connector here, we can go ahead and put the connector in there and play it out. 
We have individual units depending on the manufacturer and then some manufacturers have one unit and then we will configure that unit to be whatever the memory board thought it would be. So we basically have to individually configure it to, to be the different series that it is. Would you mind just itemizing some of the data that you can get off the FDR? The we, ABCD, can you, it would be best to do that in the next room. We can actually show it to you there. So that's the download process. Um, I was going to show you how we test the beacons. Do you want to do that now? Go ahead. So this is another example of a recorder. Um, all of the recorders are required to have a ULB or an underwater locating beacon attached. So the FDR and CVR have individual ULB beacons on them. Um, this is an underwater piezoelectric transducer that upon contact with moisture completes the circuit and sends out a signal for 30 days. Um, underwater. This has a shelf, year, shelf life of six years, so once the beacon is, is on there, it can you know, sit for six years. After that, it's swapped out. It's field replaceable. So all of the beacons are required to have um, expiration dates on them so that the operators can make sure that they, uh, they check them. So what we'll do when they come in We'll remove the beacons. So they're in there pretty snug so they don't come out, obviously. Really snug. It doesn't usually take this long, but there we go, got caught up. Okay. So this is an example of a beacon that has the expiration date on it. Um, this is the contact on this side here. Some water. This is our ULB tester that we use here in the lab. So basically um, the signal goes out at 37.5 kilohertz. So this is adjustable. We'll go ahead and put it at 37.5 and we turn it on. You can hear, if everyone can hear the audible ping. So the expiration on this is 2016, I believe, and we're able, there's some interference can we, can there. Can put that right up to the microphone for just a second? Sure. And everybody has to be quiet for just Let me see, it, it sometimes it's louder if I do this. Well, let's see if this might work a little bit better. We can change the frequency. So if you go off 37.5, it's sometimes a little bit higher pitched. So this will only activate upon contact with moisture. Uh, there are handheld devices that are programmed for 37.5 that will find this. Um, also, the, the divers have a bone induction unit. If you actually put it up, they can hear it pinging, um, and they'll pick up the signal that way. Can't hear with the human ear. It's only if you translate it. Right, with this little unit. But... Yeah, so it'll, uh, it'll translate the, the underwater devices. It's downloaded from the unit. It's still not in what we call engineering units. Uh, and what we do is we convert that data now into, into uh, the various parameters uh, that are recorded. For instance, altitude, heading, uh, airspeed, uh, and... and, and and a host of other uh, uh, 
parameters. Um, the minimum is 88 parameters, but almost all of your modern uh, aircraft now well exceed that into several hundred parameters. Uh, you, what is several hundred? 200, 800? Uh, what would you think? If, uh, it, it really depends on the aircraft. Uh, they, they can exceed a thousand. Yeah, I'd have to look. I'd have to look what that is, but I can't speak to that um, uh, uh, directly now. Um, so what Erin uh, does here is she gets the data and and begins to go through uh, the um, algorithms to do that conversion. And each box and each aircraft has its own configuration. And uh, we have files on all of these types of aircraft. We either get them from other. AIBs or from the manufacturer or from the operator. It depends on where the most current and, and complete information is. And um, in fact, behind you is, is a lot of the uh, manuals for those sorts of things. We have a lot of it electronic as well. That's just the older stuff. Uh, we, we keep a complete catalog of it. So once she gets it here and does that conversion, it's going to be uh, able to be read out by our investigators and the investigative team. And we do that in a software that we developed, and it's, and it's an acronym spelled like the word CIDER, C-I-D-E-R. Okay, that's our software that reads these data out and creates the plots. So what Aaron will start doing is, uh, in our group process uh, of investigation, we'll have party members come in technical specialists from each of the parties that can help us and assist us in validating these data sets. Um, and, and that's the primary goal. Again, like I said, we're going to try to do this within 24 hours. Uh, we want to validate the data and we want to get the most crucial uh, parameters plotted up and out to the investigators so they can start working on the most vital aspects of the accident on scene. So. Here's, I'll, I'll turn it over to Erin. She's uh, going to give you just some examples, some screenshots of what we do. You'll see the binary data on the left, then convert it to engineering units. And then we also have the ability to, to generate a real-time animation for our purposes only that helps us to validate and understand the data. Uh, uh, you, when you see a bunch of traces, uh, sometimes you want to see what's happening all at the same time in a, in a more visual uh, presentation and so we're able to make an animation. Now this is just an example. This is one of the ones we went to full production with but we also have the ability to animate the aircraft itself. The example we're going to give you here and then in the next room is what's commonly known as the Miracle on the Hudson. So it's just, uh, I'm just trying to give you an example. That's a water recovery transport aircraft uh, that we did. So uh, Aaron, why don't you take it away? So once we download that file over in the other room, we will transmit it through the network over to this system. Um, we'll have you know, a, a group, a flight data recorder group and a cockpit voice recorder group. Um, NTSB person is the group chairman, but we have people who are represented in the investigation. So there'll be somebody from the manufacturer, somebody from um, the operator, et cetera, that will be represented on that group. The reason is every single aircraft is, is very different. A lot of what we're doing here is systems and trying to validate parameters, so we need someone who can get to the answer. Um, we get information from the manufacturer of the aircraft that has a data map, and that data map translates all the zeros and ones into actual parameters. Uh, the original flight recorders were five parameters. Uh, nowadays, aircraft are being delivered with thousands of different parameters on there. So they measure all the different systems, uh, the various you know, airspeed indicators, but they'll measure all of the airspeed that, that are on there instead of just one side or the other, which is what the original designs were. So we want to get, uh, this is an example of the download file that I did. This is an example of what it really looks like. All it is is a serial data stream, so it's zeros and ones. We need to map all of these zeros and ones into how high, how fast, et cetera. We cannot do that unless we have the information from the aircraft manufacturer. So they'll provide it in a software program or in a document, and it'll tell us basically an address system. So each of these is into blocks that are uh, airing different airing standards. Each of these 12 bits, for instance, might represent airspeed. Each of these blocks that are dark and light will represent one second of data. So 
when you have a recorder that may not have um, stopped the way it normally does, you might have some corrupted or invalidated data at the, at the end of it. So you have to make sure, kind of like closing out a CD, you have to, to make sure that the program understands that there is some data there. So that's why we get down to the bit level. From the data map perspective, we use an example of the individual parameters. So we'll figure out which one of these words will map this word back to a parameter, and we'll do the engineering conversion. And what that is is depending on the different sensor on the aircraft that it's picking it up, it'll be a various you know, equation to get it back to how many Gs it was. So that's what this information is in here. There are standard maps for modern aircraft that are coming off, but the operator a lot of times has the ability to modify that if they want to for the various information that, that they're looking to capture or the rate they want to capture it at. Uh, but there isn't you know, an FAA standard or regulatory standards that they have to abide by for minimum number of parameters and sample rates, et cetera. So we will put the equations in here. And the next part of what we do, which is what the group really helps us out, is actually validating the data. You need someone, in this example, it was an A320. It's very helpful to go through and figure out, we you know, get the, the performance numbers to figure out what is an A320 supposed to rotate at, et cetera, so that we validate that information. So this is after a lot of work, we come up with uh, an engineering plot. And we will put plots together depending on the information we're getting back from on scene, on the field, and what we know about it from ATC and various other sources. Um, Are you able right now to put that plot on that screen? Uh, let's see. Okay. So that's a typical plot that we'll be generating and working with, uh, and that's ultimately what we're trying to do is validate that data and get, get that data out to the field. Where are the these lines are are Okay, so, so these are, yeah. Uh, Aaron, just use the, um, the mouse pointer there and maybe take them through one or two of the parameters. So this is a time history of data. Okay, time is on the, your so-called x-axis going along horizontally. And each of the colors associated with a different parameter. And if you find the, the color, uh, the scale associated on the left or right side of the plot, it'll give you the scale associated with that particular plot. Okay, so it's like putting a bunch of, of individual plots all on one plot. And, and that's important uh, because a lot of times we want to compare one to the other. What's the airplane doing in pitch uh, at this particular uh, airspeed, for instance? Uh, and that's what we're trying to do. And then um, Erin will go through that with her group, validate things, and identify certain events or certain issues. Uh, in particular with the data, you see the, <coughs> excuse me, there's an issue of the discontinuity of the data and that sort of thing. We point those things out to the group. Is that, when you have a discontinuity like that, is that just a fraction of a second, or can you tell us how you arrived at whatever's between the two discontinuities? Well, it varies widely. Aaron can give you some details on that. It depends. I mean, if there's any sort of a power interruption to the main source of power, it, it may be a fraction of a second, like I said, with, with those zeros and ones. Um, you can generally go into the zeros and ones and see that you'll be able to see that there'll be some sort of an interruption or a corrupt period in there. Uh, it could be a couple of seconds. It really depends on what the event is. But generally, you'll see a break in data or the numbers. You, you have uh, each of the, these blocks has an assigned number. If you start skipping numbers, then you know you've got a, what we call an out of sync situation, that it's lost its sync somehow. So, I missed this, but so what would cause that to happen? A power interruption. In this case, what was it? The bird strike or something? Or? Uh, they did have uh, they did have an engine power interruption, but it may be a bus switching. I'd have to look. In this particular, each airplane goes off of different buses. The mm -hmm. flight recorders will be off of different buses. So if you have a, a bus switch, or if there's a power interruption, or um, even the source of data that's coming in, if that gets interrupted, so you may lose some parameters, but not other parameters. So is is that area of the the grid there, is that where you look for, okay, this is where the trouble happened, or? Well, in this case, I mean, what we're looking for is normal operations. When we see a break in normal operations, so when you're on climb out, so this is altitude, 
and this is airspeed, so you have altitude, so this is an aircraft that we know is taking off. If you lose all of your engine thrust during takeoff, that's a problem area for us. So what we'll do is we'll concentrate around that area. So we rely on information, obviously, from that we've gotten in, but then we also are also looking at things in the data that, that may have caused that to happen. So there may be events back here like master warnings, cautions, et cetera. Yeah, the, another important aspect of what's done here is, is we start to time correlate everything, not only the FDR, but the CVR and the radar data and that sort of thing to make sure we have the most complete picture possible. members of our staff here and that would be a uh, representative of the various party uh, uh, group members um, and what they'll be doing is uh, Aaron will be playing back uh, the the recording so that they can listen to it uh, and then they begin to transcribe basically one sentence at a time all the way through the CVR and we have specialized software that helps us do that where we can look at the waveforms uh, uh, and and a lot of times in this process as Aaron will explain you go back and forth over the same words over and over and over to make sure you have it correct and that you have the timing associated with that correct. So, Aaron, if you could um, uh, go ahead and explain the specifics. Sure. So it's a similar process with the group chairman and obviously the, the different parties. Um, there are 30-minute recordings and two-hour recordings. We'll generally, once we get the file in here, we'll go through the entire two hours uh, first to listen to the entire thing and then we'll start the transcription process. Um, well, there's four different channels, the captain, the co-pilot, the cockpit area microphone or CAM, and a fourth interphone uh, channel. So generally one of the people from the party can identify the voices for the cockpit um, people speaking, the, the co-pilot or the captain. And once we start the transcription process, depending on the channel, and who says what, we will attribute that to the person. So hot one would be the, the captain's microphone, hot microphone. Uh, the cam is the cockpit area microphone. We'll also designate if some of the audio comes from a different device like a Egypt Wiz, you'll hear things in the background that will be making calls and we'll attribute those to an Egypt Wiz. We also put radio transmissions in there and um, generally we'll put departure or a radio transmission from the cockpit. So again, one is captain and two would be the first officer. So you can see here, this is basically a visualization of audio. So through our headsets, we're actually listening to the audio, but you have an elapsed time down here on the bottom. And these are the various channels. So you'll hear you know, the ATC on one channel, maybe on the cam and, and uh, it'll come through on the other channels. And sometimes you'll just have the one person talking. We can also visualize this differently. Let's see. So a lot of times we're listening for sounds in the background or if we're listening to alerts, et cetera, we will try to filter or enhance the sounds when we're trying to focus on something. Um, we do put the actual text, so the purpose of the group is to try to transcribe as factually as possible, and we try to come to a consensus. So you're basically all listening to the same thing. Do you hear this? Do you hear this? And it's, yes. if you have disagreement, you go through it again and again yes. until you all say, he said, she said, whatever. Yes, we try to come to a consensus, and normally we do. Um, it does, you know, there's a lot of background noise, especially when something's going wrong. So we will uh, sometimes just take a break when you're listening to it over and over and over again. It, it can get very tiring. Uh, we'll take a break, start over again in the morning, and then it will become more clear. Is it, I think Joe mentioned something about when there are, people aren't speaking, there's still sound you can hear mm -hmm. in the cockpit. Well, can you give us a sense of that? Sound similar to seat moving, sound similar to door opening, sound similar to door chime. So another, another of the sounds, for instance, there'll be background noise, and you can, you can actually, through spectrum analysis, do things like analyze uh, engine RPM from that sound, for instance, or a gearbox RPM, or even the, uh, you can derive, let's say, uh, a speed or something from tires rolling down the runway. So there's a lot you can do on the spectral side of the analysis of the of the audio file as well. Even if somebody's not speaking. Yes. Aaron, is it um, 
I would think this can be emotionally taxing to listen to these kinds of phone calls. Uh, let me see if the phone calls. Um, I would think that this can be emotionally taxing to listen to this kind of a conversation. I always relate it to what trauma surgeons must go through is you're, you're there trying to get the job done. So you separate yourself from it. I mean, you're trying to make aviation safer is what the bottom line is. So that's, that's my personal philosophy. I can't speak for anybody else, but um, you know, we want to make sure this never happens again. So it's, it's something that we know once we get to the bottom of it and, and give this tool. This is only one of many other parts of the investigation, but we know that it'll provide some information to the rest of the investigative team. Having read a few of these, occasionally you do write unintelligible, yes? Yes. It, it is very difficult to hear sometimes. Um, there's a lot, like I said, the ambient noise, especially in the older airplanes, because of just the, the microphones aren't as good. They were not wearing high, hot microphones. It's very, very difficult. And sometimes we're not going to, you know, create something. If, if nobody can understand it, we put unintelligible. I mean, we just don't, we just can't hear it. Um, there's a lot of colloquialisms that happen. I mean, when you know somebody's pointing at something, you can't hear that. So they might say, wow, that doesn't look right. No, it doesn't. But you don't know what they're talking about. And, and just how many people listen at one time? Generally, you say you start out with a group of three, right? And That's you right. expand out to? And then we'll expand out usually to, say, a group that could consist of, say, six or eight folks. Right, we've handled that in a variety of ways. You know, we can get uh, uh, folks from here that, that might speak the language, uh, our own staff, uh, folks from, say, the operator who can help us with uh, 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 that, or even uh, we've worked with our State Department to provide an interpretation. There, there's capabilities to do readouts, but when you start talking about damage and you start talking about saltwater submersion and fire exposure and all those sorts of things, and you're getting down to the chip level recovery, there's only a few laboratories that have that capability. And of the black boxes that are recovered in an accident, do you know what percentage you get in the world? We get the most, but as far as the percentage, I can't, I can't tell you, but we do get the most recorders. This is the most advanced lab. As far as, as, far as recorders coming through this laboratory, when you uh, add up flight data recorders, cockpit voice recorders, and you add up the electronics and the video type recordings. And, and we also, these labs also do all the other modes of transportation. So we have recorders on board trains and ships and that sort of thing. We're doing about 650 uh, items a year through this laboratory. 650 accidents a year are investigated through this, through this lab? 650 devices. Devices uh, are listened to. Got you. That's right. So that's both flight data and cockpit voice, right? Well, that's flight data, cockpit voice, and all those other electronics. I'm talking about, for instance, GPS, iPads, uh, cell phones, uh, video surveillance recordings, uh, and recorders off of other vehicles, uh, uh, highway vehicles. Uh, well, what kind of data can you get off of an iPhone or an, I an iPad? Right. Uh, a lot of times what we're looking at when we're looking at iPhone is activity and use. And we're looking at when the, when the phone, for instance, was being used uh, during an accident sequence. If it was during an accident sequence, prior to an accident sequence, uh, and that sort of thing. So what we're doing is we're, we're downloading the information on uh, texting or cell phone usage. Jeff, how often do you get a CBR, FDR, where you can't uh, get any information from it? It's incredibly rare. The only times we'll do that is if it's if it's completely burned up, as we to, as we told you uh, from a high high um, high high intensity, high duration fire. Uh, other than that, we're usually always successful in getting data out of the recorders.